we are going to begin. Um, first, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, it means so much to me that so many people have come and some of you have traveled great distances and it, um, it and I know that you've sacrificed a lot to be here. Um, I'd also like to publicly thank Tony Davis. He's a member of our fellowship and he's the one who kind of introduced me and, and some of the other people we fellowship here in Boise that uh, we are not so different than the many groups of the Restoration. So I'm thankful for him for just opening my eyes to this fact and, and helping us get in contact with some of you wonderful people and meet you. Um, my husband, Adrian, and I have been working on organizing this conference since January, and it's hard to believe the day is finally here. The first inklings of organizing this conference began as one of those flashes of inspiration that hits you hard. You know, the kind of inspiration where you have to ask, okay, where did that come from? Well, this thought persisted until I asked the Lord if this idea was from Him. And the, the Lord made sure that I knew it was a request from Him. So I began the process of organizing this conference. At the time, I didn't know hardly anything about the different groups of the Restoration. I grew up a typical, zealous, and stalwart member of the LDS Church and was told to stay away from, well, many of you. <laughs> um, so I was just very uneducated on any branch claiming Joseph Smith as their founder except for the LDS Church. Now that my eyes have been a bit more opened, I feel so blessed to have a greater understanding of some of the different groups, and I've been able to see into your hearts and get a feel for your love of the Book of Mormon and the Restoration. As we've worked on organizing this event, our entire fellowship has had the opportunity to attend local worship meetings with the Community of Christ, the Remnant Church, and the Temple Lot Churches. We were so warmly welcomed by each one. The Temple Lot Church always made sure we were fed plentifully, and they made a social event out of every visit. <laughs> and their food is amazing. <laughs> um, the members of the Remnant Church were eager to talk to us after their meetings about our similarities and just helped us feel accepted. We cannot thank them and each of you enough for welcoming, up, welcoming us into your congregations and helping us feel like a part of you. Um, because we are all very interconnected as we come from the same roots. I hope we can explore these founding roots today as we participate in this conference. Now, I'd like to give just a little bit about our background. Um, you're probably wondering who we are and um, who I am. What do we believe? We call ourselves the Boise Believers Fellowship. We are a group of friends who meet together and worship in each other's homes, just as the early Christians did directly after the time of Christ's ministry. We are avid believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ restored through Joseph Smith. We believe that a restoration was needed as apostasy surely had crept in at the death of Christ's apostles. We believe that Joseph Smith was called of God, stood in his presence, and was given the keys to restore Christ's gospel and open this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. We believe that Joseph barely got his foot in the door in restoring all that God had anticipated for his last day's people before he was taken and killed. We believe that God intends to finish what he began through Joseph. We believe that every scriptural prophecy will be realized, every covenant fulfilled, and that the last day Zion will be brought forth before the Lord comes in glory to redeem this creation. Many of us participating in this Boise Fellowship are former LDS who saw the church we belong to going in a completely different direction than the early church of Joseph's day. This discrepancy created conflict in our minds and caused us to search further into church history, the teachings of the Book of Mormon, and many other sources of truth that we could find. As we began to explore, we were viewed as a threat to the organization of the LDS Church. Uh, many of us have been cast out, disfellowshipped, 
even forgotten, neglected, and abandoned by those we once called our family and friends. As I mentioned earlier, growing up very LDS, we were always told to stay away from the other Mormon branches. We were taught that our LDS branch of Mormonism was the only true one, and that it was dangerous to associate with the others. Our very temple recommends could be threatened if we were to have association with any group other than the LDS Church. Now, having been excommunicated for apostasy, I have let go of that fear that once kept me blind, and I am now able to see the restoration with different eyes. Although we all have some differences in what we believe, like how the church should be organized now, or what hierarchy should look like, how priesthood authority is disseminated, or whether a temple is necessary or not, we do all believe in the Book of Mormon. We believe that Joseph stood in the presence of God and was taught line upon line about the things of godliness. We believe that after almost 2,000 years of apostasy, that God began speaking to humanity again and taught us the plan to return to his presence. What unites is certainly greater than what divides us. We also believe that priesthood authority was restored through Joseph Smith. Regarding this ironic priesthood restoration, on May 5, 1839, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery went into the woods to pray and inquire of the Lord respecting baptism for the remission of sins as they had found mentioned while translating the plates. While they were thus praying and calling upon the Lord, a messenger from heaven descended in a cloud of light and having laid his hands upon them, ordained them, saying, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and the gospel of repentance and the baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Joseph was then instructed to baptize Oliver and then Oliver Joseph. The messenger who came and conferred this priesthood was John the Baptist. This ironic priesthood is durable. It is still with us today. Even though there have been many different churches, branches, split-offs, and groups which claim their origin from the early church and restoration brought about by Joseph, this priesthood remains. This ironic priesthood gives those ordained the power to baptize. It brings about a remission of sins, blesses us with the ability to repent and be forgiven of sin, and ensures the right to continue on the path of ascension. Baptism is the gate which we must enter to have the opportunity to pr progress and become like God. In 2 Nephi, it says, For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and the Holy Ghost. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate, ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witness of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promises which he hath made, that if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. Even though Joseph died and the church fragmented, this ironic priesthood remains. This is one of the greatest gifts of the Restoration, because along with baptism and entering the gate, we also have the gift of the ministering of angels, which blesses us with the, abil the ability, if we seek it, to have association with the other side of the veil and receive instruction from God himself, just as Joseph did. If we still have access to the priesthood authority, does it matter what our organizations look like? Would it be possible to let go of our differences and see eye to eye on the parts of the restoration which actually matter? Are we willing to soften our hearts and believe that maybe God does intend to fulfill all his promises? and that he is providing a way right now for those promises to be fulfilled. I'm reminded of Alma preaching to the people of Zarahemla, and I'd like for us all to liken Alma's teachings to ourselves in our situation right now. Alma says, I say unto you that I know of myself that whatsoever I shall say unto you concerning that which is to come, and I say unto you that I know that Jesus Christ shall come, Yea, the Son, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy and truth. And behold, it is he that cometh to take away the sins of the world, yea, the sins of every man who steadfastly believes on his name. And now I say unto you 
that this is the order after which I am called, yea, to preach unto my beloved brethren, yea, and everyone that dwelt in the land, yea, to preach unto all, both old and young, both bond and free. Yea, and I say unto you, the aged and also the middle aged and the rising generation, yea, to cry unto them that they must repent and be born again. Yea, thus saith the Spirit, Repent all ye ends of the, of the earth, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Yea, the Son of God cometh in his glory, and in his might, majesty, power, and dominion. Yea, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Spirit saith, Behold, the glory of the King of all the earth, and also the King of heaven, shall very soon shine forth among all the children of men. And also the Spirit saith unto this people, Repent, for except ye repent, ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, the Spirit saith, Behold, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Therefore every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit sh shall be hewn down and cast into the fire, yea, a fire which cannot be consumed, even an unquenchable fire. Behold and remember, the Holy One hath spoken it. The Lord Jesus Christ will come in glory. In Joseph's day, it didn't seem that far distant. Um, and this is what Joseph said about this. When I contemplate the rapidity of which the great and glorious day of the coming of the Son of Man advances, when he shall come to receive his saints unto himself, where they shall dwell in his presence and be crowned with glory and immortality, when I consider that soon the heavens are to be shaken and the earth tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens are to be unfolded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and that every mountain and island are to flee away, I cry out in my heart, what manner of person ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And I have one more quote, and I'm almost done. <laughs> I will prophesy that the signs of the coming of the Son of Man are already commenced. One pestilence will desolate after another. We shall soon have war and bloodshed. The moon will be turned into blood. I testify of these things, and that the coming of the Son of Man is nigh, even at your doors. If our souls and our bodies are not looking forth for the coming of the Son of Man, and after we are dead, if we are not looking forth, we shall be among those who are calling for the rocks to fall upon them. If the coming of the Son of Man in glory was soon then, then the probability of it coming now is even greater. The signs of the heaven in the heavens are bearing witness that the coming of the Son of Man in glory is not far distant. We are commanded to be looking forward to this day and anticipating it. Therefore, there is not a greater time than for now for us to look together for the fulfillment of these prophecies and be open in the way in which God is working with a people right now. I am truly excited that we are all here together, and I pray that God's watchful eye and loving hand will be over the proceedings of this conference. It is my prayer that we can at least for a day put aside our differences, let go of our fears, and soften our hearts toward each other as well as to each other's messages. I pray that the feelings of goodwill may be so strong that even the Lord and even Joseph Smith may attend us today. I pray that we, we will will be filled with the Spirit of God in its fullest measure, and I invite all of us to repent and allow the purifying effects of the Holy Ghost to enter our hearts. Um, we will now uh, move on with the program. We are going to have a congregational hymn, Redeemer of Israel, and you should have gotten the music to this hymn. There are... Um, copies over there on that table. I will be playing the piano. I don't have anyone to lead. If you would like to lead, great. And then I've written up a little hymn history um, behind your program. Because the hymns we're singing are all hymns of the Restoration, and I hope that we all know them. Um, but some of the history behind these hymns is really interesting, and I'll, I hope you en you'll enjoy reading that. Oh. 
Oh, and right after the hymn, um, we will have Brett Corbridge come up, and um, he has a testimony he'd like to share. Yeah, let's go ahead and sing all six verses of this hymn. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. My testimony is not about doctrine, although it includes doctrine. And I'm grateful for this honor because um, the Spirit has directed that I make a plea unto myself and all of us this day. I believe that this is a holy moment that this gathering is a, co a microcosm of something the Lord intends to continue in gathering the broken elect 
the broken and flawed elect. And so I offer a testimony that is not meant to just be words, but this that must um, contain life, intelligence, the very holiness of God. The plea correlates with letting the pride and strife and contention, the same contention and jarrings that doomed the early saints in their efforts to obtain Zion to pass at this very moment out of our hearts, out of our minds, that the unbelief might be cast out. For 185 plus years, we have been suffering with strife, which I remember when I first learned the real definition of strife. I thought it meant more contention or stress. It means to seek doctrinal or intellectual superiority. That's what strife is. And we know from DNC 105, Behold, I say unto you, there were jarrings and contentions, envies and strifes. Isn't it interesting that strife is plural? There were strifes and lustful and covetous desires. Therefore, these things, they polluted their inheritance. And when we go into strife, even if we're doctrinally correct, the truth does not justify a poor, ungodly approach to another soul seeking truth as well. I know that I'm surrounded by seekers of truth. My assumption today is that every soul is here because they seek Zion, they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they honor the prophet, and that we completely disagree about almost everything. <laughs> so we could consecrate this day in this moment. We could celebrate the majesty of the King, the majesty of the Christ, and the nobility of his prophet, despite the mistakes and human flaws of Joseph as he grew in his prophetic path, because all prophets are different and all prophets progress in their progression to exaltation. I witnessed Joseph was noble. He is and was noble. He's a trusted source. He said, and I offer a second witness on what Tasha said. I do believe Joseph is with us. He said, near the end of near the end of the life, his life, the prophet confided, I could do so much for my friends if I were on the other side of the veil. He informed Benjamin Johnson, I would not be far from you, and if left on the other side, I would still be working with you and with a power greatly increased to roll on this kingdom. So my testimony is we have a correct hierarchy. If a person is going to uh, say the things I desire to say about Joseph Smith, there has to be a correct hierarchy with acknowledgement to Almighty God, acknowledgement to the Holy Mother, praise for the Son of God who died for me, and in the proper place for the man who also died for me. I have determined uh, that I will live for Christ and I will die for Joseph if needed. I find great peace in when, um, my, when my wife and I decided um, to leave, uh, when we couldn't bear the apostasy of the LDS Church any longer, and the Lord allowed us to go. It wasn't in pride. <laughs> but we determined three things that were non-negotiable because everything became uh, unknown. All of these religious certitudes that we thought were true became half-truths and deceit. But we determine, and I hope this is useful to you, we will stay with the God. We will stay with God and his Christ, number one. And two, we will stay with the prophet Joseph Smith. And number three, we will stay with scripture. And we have found great peace and power in keeping that rock and then finding out that we know nothing. I, I have, as a quick aside, I am so happy to be completely ignorant. I had no idea. It, I am so happy 
to learn and get eradicate the unbelief as fast as I possibly can. I, I stand before you as someone who lacks knowledge, but the purpose, and this morning I woke up and God's like, you're going to read DNC 130. And I'm like, they've heard that a thousand times. And I wanted to read it out of the TNC. And he's like, no, for this group, you're going to read it out of the DNC. And so then I argued and gave up and submitted. <laughs> but, but listen to this, because this is the testimony. This is the meeting. This is what could happen today. If you'll bear with it, I offer a simple dedication that this day could be holy, that the holiness of Jesus could come into this moment. This strife could be cast out. We could go forward into our areas of influence and end strife. It doesn't mean, before I read this scripture, it doesn't mean that truth is wishy-washy. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. There, as a quick aside, there's so many asides, but there's no time to explain this, but when I was coming here, there's a tension between love and truth. There's a, there's a dichotomy that do we go on the love side of the truth or do we speak the truth? And the reason I bring this up is what the Spirit has taught me is the way to have love and truth because that's when strife ends. You still speak the truth. There is no minimizing of the truth as we climb higher and higher and higher on that ladder, but without the strife because we've chosen love instead. And what he told me was very similar to what Adrian taught me. If you want oneness in your fellowship, if you want oneness in your church, have oneness with God. Become individually one with God, and the byproduct, the byproduct will be oneness in our fellowships. So if right here in this very moment we open our hearts today, I have found that every single word means something different and something greater than I thought. Every single word. The, it, I guess this sounds like an advertisement. No matter what you do, please read the glossary in this book. Even if you have your own path and your own assignment from the Lord, do not miss the glossary in this book because I know you're a seeker of truth and you will be edified unless you let the strife or pride stop you from receiving greater light knowledge. Look at DNC 130. Now, don't tune out because when someone starts to read this scripture, I'm like, I know, I know. Revelation from Joseph Smith, 1843, which I bear witness. I know. He's like, is he ever going to get to the scripture? I bear witness Joseph was not a fallen prophet. I witness in the name of God. No apologies. It's 1843, and this is what comes through him. Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto this life, it will rise with us in the res resurrection. Don't tune out. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through diligence and obedience, he will have so much advantage in the world to come. What, as an example of how the Lord is constantly taking us deeper, just this morning, I'd never thought of this. He's like, Brett, whatever principle of intelligence we attain in this life will attain with us in the resurrection. What if we died today in this very room? What if our unbelief died? What if we left? No more contention. No more strife. No more trying to um, push and there was a death within us that we might be born again. Because look at 19, and if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence, yes, light and truth are synonyms. Yes, it's the glory of God. But what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, it has to go beyond mental knowledge. If I'm just standing here talking doctrine, dry rhetoric, that's nice. But if, if God comes... If the Spirit comes, if holiness comes into this room, then we have intelligence. There must be knowledge and intelligence. Two words, correlated, synonyms. 
then we will have so much advantage in the world to come. I was like, well, yeah, when I die, it'll be great. We'll learn a bunch of things. Why not die today? Why not let strife die? The plea that came, <laughs> because when they announced this conference, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I'm laying there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and God's like, the plea is to rebuke the spirit of contention and jarring and strife and invite the spirit of holiness and truth into this room. And to finish up, the Lord's so smart, he said, you have to use the DNC because when you look over on the page, and I don't mind using the DNC, but over on the same exact page, when the Savior shall appear, we shall see him as he is. And that same sociality which exists among us here. Is there not holiness in this room? Is not the Lord merciful to come? He comes quick. If, <laughs> if we're broken and he comes quick, I qualify because... I just learned, here's an example of this glossary. I just learned the difference between sin and iniquity. That changed my life. The joke, which is true, I have so many sins and I have so much iniquity that it, it's beautiful. I had no idea. But I didn't know they were different. So if I can cast out that unbelief, the same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there. Only it will be coupled with eternal glory. So my plea is that we allow the intelligence and knowledge and mental doctrine uh, and pure knowledge, that's where it gets interesting, be gathered into our soul and our mind and our heart, but let there be life. Let the holiness of the Christ come into the soul. <laughs> when I got excommunicated, I pled with the stake president, you're losing the youth because they're bored out of their minds. You can't socialize and program them into obedience. The only thing that will save the youth is the Holy Spirit. It tastes good, it's beautiful, it's uplifting, and it's magnificent. I testify that God is with us today that he will bring glory into this room, into our hearts. I will close with this quote. Can you not hear Joseph today? <laughs> Brethren, shall we not go on in so great a cause? We've all heard this, but today could be a new crossroads. Go forward and not backward. Courage, brethren, on to victory. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And then maybe one that you haven't heard as much, he, he put a little P.S. Oliver Cowdery wrote a letter to the saints. He put a little P.S. Brethren, if I were with you, <laughs> and I will say wherever Joseph is, that's where I intend to be. Brethren, if I were with you, I should take an active part in your suffering, and all the nature shrinks, yet my spirit would not forsake you. Oh, be of good cheer, for the redemption draweth near. Oh, God, save my brethren in Zion. Oh, brethren, give up all to God and forsake all for Christ. May we all uh, sake, forsake all for Christ. I testify that the majesty of the Holy One is real. I will fall before my Savior, and I will salute Joseph, and together we will go to the Father. There are no apologies for the truth, but let us teach the truth without strife, jarring, and contention. And when we don't agree on what is true, let us be mindful of the lines and the progressions and the unbelief and the cultural history that we don't interpret the same, because the love and the truth can come together. And then God, the oneness of God, is manifest. And I witness this to you as your friend, as one who loves the Lord, and one who salutes Joseph. And um, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, our next speakers are uh, James and Patrick McKay, or Jim. <laughs> Jim and Patrick McKay. We had the privilege of meeting with them yesterday and just getting to know them a little bit, and it was just awesome. <laughs> We're so excited they're here and can speak to us, and um, we'll give them the next hour, and I'll let them kind of introduce themselves. Would it be possible if we could just bow our heads for a moment? Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, some of your children have purposed to gather in this place today. And in spite of whatever may separate us, Father, we know there is a power that can draw all men into your will. And so simply and humbly, Father, we would petition thee in the name of our Lord that you would be merciful and kind and gracious unto us this day, that you would overlook and even pardon our sins and allow us for this moment in time to be agreed as touching one thing, that the promise might be fulfilled, that you would grace us with your presence. I pray this humbly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce uh, Patrick and myself and tell you a little bit about our history. Had the pleasure to meet with some of you uh, last night. It was, it was pretty joyous. Don't remember a lot of names, but it really was special. We really feel honored uh, to have been asked to come. When we read on the, on the web page, uh, the focus, uh, Patrick and I said to ourselves, boy, that sounds like something that we could have written, although maybe not as well as our sister Tasha wrote it, but certainly the intent. I would like to tell you that uh, our background, our faith journey, our faith experience comes out of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 1982, we were silenced for our names being in the paper to participate in a worship service at a non-competing time on a Saturday evening. And that began our journey that led to the formation of the first restoration branch, at least in our part of the restoration in May of 1984. We have remained in a restoration branch setting since that time. Uh, we do not come to represent anybody, but just so you know, we work in harmony out of the Joint Conference of Restoration Branches, which is not a church. It's simply an organization that helps promote the spreading of the gospel. We've been blessed as elders to be able to be in many places in the world, either together or with other uh, brethren. We have been in Malawi, in Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Tanzania, Cameroon, Liberia, Nepal, England. And soon in, uh, in uh, the South Sea Islands, we've labored throughout the United States. And that's a part of our, our missionary type ministry. But we're here today because Patrick and I have believed for a long time that bridges have to be built amongst restorationists, that we have created walls, and we've concentrated on the few things that separate us. And we've overlooked the many, many things that we have in common that are truly foundational. The Book of Mormon, the belief in a holy city, the return of our Savior, the gathering of Israel. So many incredible things, but we stumble at the things that we see differently. And so about a decade ago, we began a process called a Book of Mormon Festival started out with one speaker, Patrick, and that's grown into a really an amazing thing where we have eight qualified speakers. We are in a special association with a handful of professors at BYU, 
and we put on a two-day, two-evening presentation in Independence every spring, and it solely is centered on the Book of Mormon. No organization, no unique doctrine, but we promote the book because we believe the book truly is the keystone of our religion. And it is the unfolding of God's divine plan to gather Israel in the last days and build a holy city. And so we have moved among many branches of the restoration. We've had doors open and opportunities where we've occupied pulpits where ministers and other faiths have never been allowed to enter. We've taught classes, borne formal and informal testimonies, and had many wonderful relationships and conversations with individuals in other parts of the restoration. And we have begun this process believing that God desires to heal his work so that it can find its fulfillment and completion. We live in a day when it seems that everything that can be shaken is being shaken and will continue to be shaken until God's divine plan finds its fulfillment. God's kingdom will be, and the real question is, will you and I be a part of it? Will we lay down our weapons of warfare, will we bury them? No more to inflict pain and harm and death and violence against fellow believers in the Latter-day Gospel. Are we going to realize that the walls that have separated us are man-made walls? We have engineered a belief that I can be your brother, I can be your sister, vice versa, I'm not a sister, but you, you know what I mean. And I can love you, and I can respect you, and I don't have to agree with you on all points. And you don't have to agree with me. And you don't have to come and stand in my square of dirt, and I don't have to come and stand on, on your square. But I believe, we believe, that if we can lay down the contentions and the strifes, which we've just heard about, that God will be able to work in our lives and perform a miracle. He'll heal us. You've all heard the passage in Latter-day Revelation. If you're not one, you're not mine. So where does that leave us? Are we one? Have we been the Lord's? Is that our fault? Is it His fault? The reality is we have not lived to see the fulfillment of God's divine plan. Now, we've been a part, excuse me, I'm just, uh, I'm not distracted. I've got to make sure that I don't run over my time because I know Patrick needs a little more time. In our part of the restoration, there have been efforts throughout our history of working harmonies, and they've all failed. Every single one of them have failed because when the final note was struck, it was always, I want to have a relationship with you, but you've got to see it my way. You've got to come my way. That doesn't work. The proper working harmony is to let people be who they are and build a relationship in those areas that we do hold in common. But before I sit down, I would like to, I'd like to lay a challenge to each one of us. You know, we all stand in front of the mirror in the morning. I know Christopher spends a lot of time on his hair. Um, but I'd like you to think about this the next time you stand in front of a mirror and ask yourself some really serious questions. When was the last time any one of you moved a Mount Zarin? When was the last time any one of you set at defiance the armies of nations or had rivers moved out of their course, or stopped the mouths of lions. When was the last time any one of you commanded the elements in the name of Jesus and they obeyed you? When was the last time you raised somebody from the dead? Men who've occupied the Melchizedek ministry, what's your track record? Can you honestly say, that when you've taken your hands off the heads of those you've been called upon that have stood in need 
and you've presented them to our Heavenly Father, that they've climbed up out of their bed or got up out of that chair and were totally restored. It's a pretty sobering thought, isn't it? When you come to the realization, it doesn't matter what part of the restoration you've been in, there is a total failure on the part of the Lord's covenant peoples to approximate what He's asked us to do. And there are really only two corporate goals that God has asked of us, and we have failed in these goals. We have not gathered Israel, and there is no holy city. 188 years. Israel has not been ga gathered, and there is no holy city. I'm not saying those things to make you or me feel bad. I'm saying those things to awaken us to the realization that the restoration is broken, but there is a God in heaven that wants to heal it. He wants to breathe fresh air across His creation that it might arise in the strength of our Lord and fulfill the divine destiny that He has that a holy city would stand upon this continent, that the northern kingdom of Israel would be gathered to this, the new Jerusalem, and the southern kingdom gathered to the old Jerusalem in anticipation of the coming of our Savior. And so this morning, throughout the day, as we give consideration to these things, as we move amongst each other, I hope that heaven and earth can find an intersection here today and that we can begin to realize if we haven't already that we can love those that see things different than us and we can find places to meet in a common experience believing that at some point the Holy Spirit will move upon the hearts of those types of people and all the wrongs will be made right all the false traditions will be revealed. Whatever misunderstandings or perceptions we have about the word of the Lord and how it's properly interpreted will be made known. And if our Savior were to come to that door, even right now, and stick his head in and said, would you all come and follow me? I'm confident every one of us would arise and go follow the Master. And before we ever got through that threshold of that door, no one would any longer be concerned about any difference because the Master would show us exactly what the way is. And so we commend the work of the kingdom to you this morning. Uh, Patrick is going to share a, a presentation that, that really puts some uh, skin on the bone, so to speak, give you some real simple things that uh, you can draw parallels from that will ho hopefully help us all see what God's desire is for us as His people in these the last days. Okay. So we want to talk about what I've termed the healing of the breach. Scientists tell us that a population with more genetic variation has a better chance of surviving and flourishing than a population with limited genetic, dif genetic differences. Research affirms that hereditary diversity decreases the occurrence of the unfavorable congenital traits. Some of the individuals in a group can hold traits that make them resistant to such factors as disease or tolerance to heat or cold, thereby increasing the group's chance for survival when these groups go ahead and breed with others. Conversely, in small isolated populations, individuals that are forced to breed with close relatives increase those genetic flaws. When inbreeding occurs, innate weaknesses found in the parents can be multiplied into future generations. Within the restoration, there are both historical and spiritual variations among the saints. 
All branches of the Restoration have typically viewed these as problematic, standing aloof in an attempt to keep their spiritual gene pools untainted or free of contamination that they might remain pristine. Have you ever heard that? However, by isolating our spiritual gene pools, we've limited our ability to fight off the disease of criticism and unbelief that surrounds the saints. Go to the internet, read about the assault on Joseph Smith, the Restoration, the Book of Mormon. There are numerous casualties in this spiritual war in which we're all engaged, and many have become lost. In our divided condition, we've yet to redeem Zion, gather Israel, nor have we witnessed the fall of Babylon. The honest in heart among the children of men are still waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. As more genetic variability within the plant and animal kingdoms lead to the likelihood that the offspring will be resistant to disease and will survive, the same is true of the spiritual continuity and life of the church. This type of spiritual genetic diversity can result in an offspring with unique genetic blueprints, different from either parent, or in this case, our various church organizations. You know, when the early church burst forth, there was a church. People joined the church, but the message wasn't the church. The message was to restore men to a knowledge of the covenants to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and prepare for his return. And we've been in the business of building church organizations, and it's at the expense of fulfilling those covenants. The Book of Mormon reminds us that God has been in the process of joining different groups of people to keep them viable. If you're going to point that way, that okay. we need to hear you. All right. Thank you to keep them viable in previous generations. Notice what the Book of Mormon says. Now, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. Have you ever considered yourself a branch of the restoration, a portion, an offspring? What are you connected to? If a branch exists, it has to be connected to something. It has to be connected to the trunk because it's through those roots that you are sustained and survive. The prophetic Book of Mormon foretells that in our day, there are promises that will help strengthen and preserve the spiritual gene pool of his ancient covenant people, the house of Israel. And the branches of the natural tree will I graft in again into the natural tree. And the branches of the natural tree will I graft into the natural branches of the tree. And thus I will bring them together again, and they shall bring forth the natural fruit, and they shall be one. I think it was uh, Tasha that said she was taught to not have anything to do with other portions of the restoration. Is that what you said, Tasha? Yeah. Okay. That's not what this particular prophecy implies. This allegory pertaining to the diaspora of Israel and their eventual gathering is also applicable to the scattered of the restoration. Nephi taught us this. We can liken all scripture unto us that it might be for our profit and learning. If Nephi could liken all scripture to he and his brethren, we too can liken all scripture unto us. Because the word of God is timely as well as timeless. It speaks to those in the past, the present, and in the future. In our day, the God of Israel will accomplish in the restoration movement what he purposes to do in the entire house of Israel splicing his saints together to become resistant to the maladies of censure, reproach, and unbelief by our opponents to create a spiritually strong and healthy people who will eventually bear his image as realized in the holy city. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's speaking of our time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Where do you want to be gathered? Do you want to be a part of this great unfolding mystery? 
In the early church, he says, Behold, I will reveal unto you a mystery. I will gather you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. I want to share a little parable. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who had an old mule. The mule fell into a deep well and began to cry loudly. Hearing his mule cry, the farmer came over and assessed the situation. The well was deep. The mule was heavy. He knew it would be difficult, if not impossible, to lift the mule out. Because the mule was old and the well was dry, the farmer decided to bury the animal in the well. In this way, he could solve two problems at the same time, put the old mule out of his misery and have the well filled in. The farmer called upon his neighbors to assist him, and they agreed to help. To work they went. Shovel full of dirt after shovel full of dirt began to fall on the mule's back. The old mule became hysterical. Then all of a sudden an idea came to the mule. Each time he would throw a shovel of dirt on his back, he would shake it off and step up. Shovel full after shovel full, the mule would shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. Pretty soon the old mule stepped over the edge of the well and trotted off to the shock and the astonishment of all the neighbors. What seemed like that which would bury him actually blessed him, all due to the manner in which he handled his adversity. Have some of you come through adversity? Have you lost family and friends? Has your heart been broken? Are you still possibly divided with those that you love most? Could the old mule represent the restoration and the farmer and his neighbor, the churches of the world who've combined against the saints and the covenant people of the Lord to bury the Book of Mormon? Some, even within our own churches, have tried to bury the Book of Mormon. There are many people who don't realize or have forgotten that it is, in fact, a book and not just a hit musical. It isn't really <laughs> acceptable to mock and dismiss it. It's prerequisite for being taken seriously by the opponents of the Restoration. You can read all about this in a little book called The Lost Book of Mormon, a quest that just might be the great American novel, Abby Steinberg. For Book of Mormon believers, the assault on the Latter-day work can really be used to lift us out of the well of opposition and cause us to step into the holy city, gather Israel, and stand in holy places as we watch for the return of the Savior and we see Zion redeemed. Do you believe in Zion? Zion is the pure in heart. Zion is a condition, but it's also a place. In the early church, they were of one accord and in one place. And on the day of Pentecost, he poured out his spirit, and every man heard the gospel in his own tongue. We're called this morning to shake it off and step up. There are many people who have remained faithful to the gospel as it has been delivered to them, but it's been delivered to each of us a little differently. And that apparently is a dilemma for us. But we're all in the latter-day light. We should champion all efforts within the different branches of the Restoration which advocate and promote the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. You know why? The Book of Mormon is our Rosetta Stone. That book will eventually allow us all to speak the same language, becoming of one heart and one mind, dwelling in righteousness, and there will be no power combined against us that will overcome us if we're united on that which we know to be true. Enemies abound attempting to distant all the work by sowing doubt in the hearts and the minds of the saints. Casualties of the conflict have been realized in each portion of the restoration. This is an island right here. This conference is an island. Many people, when they read about things that happened in the early church and what they see happening today, they just leave the restoration. They don't find a safe place to stand. This is an island that has sprung up out of nowhere, seemingly, to give the saints here an opportunity to find solid ground. Our scattered condition limits us from combining our knowledge, our resources, our gifts, our testimonies, our faith to speak with one voice against the avalanche of unbelief and criticism expressed against the angel message. We share one common view or belief that we all belong to the one true church. How many of you belong to the true church? 
You know, I, I heard a, a professor from BYU say, you know, he was a young boy and he had this friend, and young teenager, and he really liked his friend. And he went to his mom and he says, you know, I really like Jeff. It's too bad he belongs to the Church of the Devil because he's not a member of the LDS Church. In our zeal and desire to be right, our hyper-focus has oftentimes distorted our vision. Sometimes we can be recipients of additional blessings if we willingly blur traditional boundaries, not doctrine, that have separated us for too long. Some of you have had this done. You know what, I, you know what that is? Blended vision. It's a form of LASIK surgery that attempts to do the very thing we're discussing. The ophthalmologist will operate on your weaker eye, making you slightly short-sighted, which will improve your close-up vision. Metaphorically speaking, we all could benefit from this type of surgery, making our path clearer as he moves to reunite his saints. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they will humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. I want you to know I use the RLDS Book of Mormon first and the LDS second because that's the book I'm familiar with. I could have turned it around, but there is no difference. So our weakness can become our strength because we then become dependent on the author and finisher of our faith, and weak things can become strong, just like in LASIK surgery. Associations right now are being forged. They're creating deep bonds of friendship. These can allow us to see perhaps for the first time that we are not really alone. There are others who, in spite of holding views different than ours, are nevertheless as committed as you and I are to the latter-day work and are also possessors of the genuine manifestations of the Spirit. I'm the first to acknowledge we have differences. Some may even be significant, but friendships unite us. When we consider our destiny as saints of the latter days, our hearts should be made glad by the foretaste of those joys which will be ours when we're gathered together in a holy city. If you look down a two-lane highway, as far as you can see, you know what happens? It becomes one lane. That is our divine destiny. Somehow, we have got to find a way to remove the walls and find that we have the same destiny and he will lead us on that same path. The woman, which was the church of God, that's from the inspired version of the Joseph Smith translation. I want to share an experience. A fellow I know had a dream. He said he attended the Zarahemla branch, which was my home congregation, on October 23rd in 2012 to hear a speaker from the Church of Jesus Christ bicker tonight. He listened, but he said, I was not impressed, and he went home, went to bed, and he dreamed a dream. I saw a woman tall and stately, and she had the word law written over her chest. I immediately understood she represented the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I looked again and saw a woman clothed in gray clothes, somewhat bent over and humble. She had written across her chest the word custodian. I understood she represented the Church of Christ Temple Lot. I again looked and saw a woman with the word loyalty written across her chest and realized she represented the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Once again I looked and beheld a woman and she had the words many gifts written over her chest and I was made to understand she represented the Church of Jesus Christ Bickertonites. When I awoke, I shared the dream with my wife and this is what she said. Oh, it's like the pieces of a puzzle all these different women will get together. I said, no, they all represented the same woman, but with different characteristics. Have you ever considered the possibility that we are all the church of Jesus Christ? And that we all, at the death of Joseph, when the church fragmented, priesthood went in all these directions, and we've simply magnified the things that are wrong in Utah or the things that are wrong in Pennsylvania or the things that are wrong with the reorganization. And so we've refused to see that God has 
shed his light in each of these groups to preserve his saints for his own will and his own way. I mentioned to someone yesterday that if you look at a tapestry and you look at the back side, it's all crisscrossed and knotted. It's really pretty hard to look at. But if you turn it over, you can see a beautiful tapestry. We've been too disposed to look at the back of the tapestry. But the, arter, art, the artist or the master artisan wants us to turn it over and see what it is he's attempting to do. As all of you know, fruit trees cross-pollinate. We need to know also that many require another tree for pollination. And it's not just the same variety, but it's a different variety of the same fruit. So a Bing tree and a Royal Ann tree can cross-pollinate each other. Is it possible that saints in the Great Salt Lake Basin can help cross-pollinate saints in Pennsylvania or in Missouri that are a different part of the restoration, that he might preserve unto himself the fruit which is most precious unto him. What a marvelous picture sown into nature, revealing the process he intends for his most precious fruit, his saints, the scattered of the restoration. And they became like unto one body, and the fruit were equal. And the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. You remember in the parable of Jacob in your uh, fifth chapter of Jacob, I believe, our third chapter, there were, the tree was old and began to decay. It was the house of Israel. And he took and put plantings in various parts of the vineyard, some in a good spot, some in a poor spot, and some in even a poor spot, some in a choice spot. But they all bore fruit. And the express purpose was that at the end of the parable, he takes branches from these various trees and grafts them back into the mother tree so that he can preserve unto himself the fruit. If he's going to do that with the house of Israel, he certainly can do it with the restoration. Remember, we all have the same mother, but we're separated at birth. The churches of the restoration are simply different varieties of the same fruit and can and should be used to help cross-pollinate the fruit of the kingdom of God. I bet you don't know what that is. I didn't either. It was my four-year-old grandson that taught me this. This is called a siphonophore. This creature is not actually a creature at all, but it's, a, it's multiple tiny creatures called zoids, all living and working together. They combine to create what's called a siphonophore, a long, thin, sometimes transparent floating colony that can curiously resemble a jellyfish. The colonial siphonophore is composed of many physiologically cohesive zoids. Each zoid is structurally similar to other independent animals, but the zoids are all attached to each other uh, rather than living independently. Each zoid is highly specialized. For example, the nectophores, which propel the colony forward, but they lack the ability to feed whereas the feeding polyps allow the creatures to eat, but not swim. So basically, each individual organism lacks the functionality that another one has, and therefore relies on its friends to do for others what it cannot do for itself. Most zoids are so specialized, they lack the ability to survive on their own. Now, you in this group that have landed here on this island that sprung up out of the ocean, can you survive? Will you survive? What if you're like one of those zoids and that he's created a certain characteristic that's unique from your part of the restoration? Maybe you can eat, maybe you can swim, maybe you can dance, maybe you can sing. But there are other parts of the restoration. The siphonophore is a great prophetic metaphor found in nature illustrating the divine destiny of the scattered of the restoration, how we can come together. Each branch of the church has a particular function to play and is part of something bigger than itself in the unfolding drama of Zion and her redemption. That's our divine destiny, to become one people, united in Christ, in the fullness of the gospel, embracing the angel message that it might sweep the earth with a flood to gather out his elect 
in preparation for the return of the Savior. That's our calling. We need to make our callings and election sure. Typically, the saints view the church as an organization, but God, on the other hand, has designed his church as a living organism, active, breathing the gospel of the kingdom, which is defined as righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We've perverted the gospel when we've made it an organization. Not that there isn't structure and not that these aspects aren't true, but it's muted the real message, which is to be the body of Christ, living and breathing the gospel of the kingdom. So, my time is up. I want to share with you that I've written a little book. It's soon to be released. I have about 45 or 50 of these copies. Uh, one per family would probably work. But it announces what this book is about, when it's going to be available, and I hope you'll take one. I also have just a few of these, and you can share these. It's called Witnessing with the Book of Mormon. In the early church, the Book of Mormon was used differently than it's used today. And I believe the Book of Mormon was the fundamental dynamic message the early church used to go forth and spread the gospel of the kingdom. And so it's a dichotomy of what the church did then, what the restoration does now, and showing the power and the impact of what happens when we use this book. Have you ever heard the Book of Mormon is a second witness of Jesus Christ? That's true. But what happens is when we take that approach, it becomes secondary. I believe it's the primary witness of the Latter-day message. And that if we would use this book as it was in the early days, we would see God adding to the church daily such as should be saved as the kingdom of God would roll forth until it would overcome every clime and every nation, and he would gather his people. So may God bless you. May his spirit abide with you. We don't have time for questions, I don't think. You actually have about 10 minutes. Okay, I do have time for questions. <laughs> so I, I didn't know. Uh, does anybody have any, was anything unclear? Uh, is it something we can work with? Does anybody have any ideas? Okay. Say, oh, thank you, Patrick. So, since we have a minute, how would you summarize how the Book of Mormon was used differently in the beginning? Well, basically, the Book of Mormon was its own witness. Today, we might say, have you read from um, Psalms 85, 11? Truth will come out of the earth and righteousness shall come down from heaven. Or we might go to Ezekiel and talk about the two sticks. Or we might go to Isaiah 29 and talk about a sealed book. And we believe all those things, and we can teach those things. But in the early church, they simply presented the book, and those who received it received a witness. And because they had a witness the book was true, they were then open to hear the fullness of the gospel. And what's happened today is we tell people, do you believe in Jesus? We talk to them about the Bible. We try to find common ground. We perhaps tell them that Jesus built a church. It had apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, gifts, fruits, etc. And then if we get our courage up, maybe one day we'll, we'll say, by the way, we believe in the Book of Mormon, and I want to bear my testimony. But in the early church, the first thing they did, the first missionary was Samuel Smith. He simply presented the book and said, I believe if you receive this book and ask God, you will receive a witness of it. And the church grew exponentially in those days. And this little pamphlet also contains many testimonies in our day of when that has been applied and the marvelous manifestations that have accompanied it. Yes, I don't know your name. I love your metaphor of the Sisonophore. Have you given thought have you given thought to the notion of the Borg from Star Trek? <laughs> there you go. You know, it's unending what you can do. That's right. It's, That's right. It's not important enough to take seriously, but the idea is quite empowering, that we truly might be much more together than we are separately. Right. This little book has 24 metaphors like the siphonophore, the redwood tree, the hub of a wheel, 
uh, spring water. They're, they're all identified in here, and I weave together the concept that the churches of the Restoration are pieces of the puzzle, and that it's God's intent for that puzzle to come together. So and you're saying there are many analogies to what you're describing. Yes, you many know, similes. To the board, like, you know, the, the wheel might work. Exactly. The, the, there are just a multitude of examples that we could give, and, and I do in this book give many of those. I'd like to comment on white light. White light can be go can go um, into a I think it's called a spectrum a spe spectrometer, and it divides into different colors: red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and if you can uh, help your mind compare that to Joseph Smith and the original church, and it's divided off into different colors or different branches, how about we come together at least as people and with love and bring the white light of Christ fully together again as one? That's awesome. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, <clears throat> my comment is this. I got here a little bit late, and I have to leave. I have a farm I have to go take care of. But um, I believe that uh, there should not have been a church organized, that the Book of Mormon just should have gone forth through the world. The three witnesses, the eight witnesses, <clears throat> Joseph Smith should have been, I guess, the, the publishing committee and uh, just just let it go like that. And I think that the Book of Mormon, if that would have been the uh, route uh, that the, the restorers took, that the Book of Mormon would be widely used today, maybe as much as the Bible. That's just my belief. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, yeah, well, I, I believe that, that the Book of Mormon has been downplayed. And although we all say we believe in it, uh, and we do, as, as our various parts of the Restoration, it hasn't been primary. In fact, in 1985, Ezra Taft Benson, the president of the Mormon Church at the time, the 11th president, he said, our church is under condemnation because we've taken lightly the Book of Mormon, the New Covenant. And he wanted to change that process, and, and I think that was a good thing that the LDS Church did. And they began to emphasize the book, although they called it Another Witness of Jesus Christ. I wish they hadn't identified their missionary book that way, but the Mormon Church did begin to grow as a result of that. And God bless them. They have translated the Book of Mormon into over a hundred different languages. I commend them for that. That's remarkable. That book needs to go through every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And I believe God has blessed that effort. And that's one aspect of the Mormon church that I think we should champion. We should uh, praise the Lord that he's been able to use that avenue to spread that book. And, and God will, he will make all the wrongs right as the band plays the coming home song, so to speak. Over here, there was a comment. Yeah, um, just real quick. So uh, your, your presentation was fantastic. Um, Question. So bringing the restoration branches together, what would be your common aim uh, to bring everybody together? You mean the mechanism that would do that? Or the t common goal, the common goal, the common aim to bring the restoration branches together? Well, the scriptures, the Book of Mormon itself says, blessed are those who shall seek to bring forth my Zion, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. Many of you believe that when you were baptized, had hands laid on your head, you were a recipient of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, and I believe that's true, that within the restoration, people have obeyed the gospel, they've entered the waters of regeneration, they've had their sins remitted, and they've received the gift of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, and they're part of the kingdom of God. But do we have the power of the Holy Ghost? Brother Jim mentioned, can we break every band, stand in the presence of God, put it defiance the armies of the earth, quench the violence of fire? Can we perform the kind of miracles we read about in the scriptures? 
you know, there's the gifts of the Spirit, and then there's miracles. And this is part of the destiny of the Lord's people. And so I believe that if we would combine our testimony in seeking to bring forth and establish his Zion, God would do the heavy lifting, unite us as a people, and those things that we see differently, those things that we're short-sighted on, the degree of organization we need, the structure that he needs to build his kingdom would all be forthcoming, and we would walk on the same page. That's our destiny. So Zion is the, the ultimate goal of the latter-day work that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, that we may have this hope that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen? Amen. 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 I knew I could get an amen from the Mormon church because <laughs> they say it after every prayer. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, just set these up here. There's a, a few to take, and um, you're welcome to have them. Thank you so much, Jim and Patrick. Just really enjoyed everything you had to say. And they traveled here from Independence, so we're grateful that they, they did that. Um, our next speaker is Michael Kelly. And um, we met him when we attended the local Temple Lot congregation. And we're, we've heard him um, teach Sunday school from, and he's used the Book of Mormon each time, and we're excited to hear what he has to say today. And um, Michael, we've got lunch scheduled at about 12.20. Um, I'll give you a five minute. Okay. Greetings. Uh, I'm Michael Kelly. I'm a local around here. I live in Nampa. Uh, we got a small group we meet with regularly here in Eagle. Um, I do not officially recognize our group. Uh, this is all on my own. Um, I, I hold uh, no priesthood authority. I'm just a Joe the mechanic, but Mike the mechanic. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to start off with a testimony uh, how I came to find the restoration and Christ's redeeming love. I, I had a rather troubled youth uh, being raised by an alcoholic father and being pretty much a midget at the time. I was a, a target of bullying quite often and it led to a pretty twisted soul. Uh, and going through years and years of just emptiness and worldliness and things that just aren't good, you know. And uh, when I reached the age of 23, I remembered uh, this little group that talked about this book called The Way, which is kind of a not-so-great translation of the Bible. But I started reading it and started little bit by little bit reaching out to God. And then a, a friend led me to visit a Seventh-day Adventist church down there in South Phoenix. And it was quite an adventure for me because I was the only white guy in there. Uh, and they treated me like a brother. They really did. And through this humble man, the simple gospel of Christ he preached, I became converted. And you know, I started reaching out to God with a lot of faith and was preparing to be baptism, baptized. I, uh, I took hold of that concept of washing away your sins, which I had uh, plenty, <laughs> and, uh, and to have that burden and guilt washed away, it, it really was something I, I grasped and, and reached out for. And I shared this with my mother, who was LDS. And I had been raised LDS as a child, but often the, the kids I went to church with are the same ones that beat the snot out of me in, in school. So <laughs> I, just, 
I, I was never converted, never believed. Uh, actually, I was mad at God. If he existed, he was a jerk, and I wanted nothing to do with him. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So I, I went through all that. You know, I, I wandered away from the LDS and all sorts of religion. You know, I was never converted. But when I share my mother, my uh, intent on being baptized, uh, she being LDS, and, and she herself was reuniting with them too, uh, she sent me a Book of Mormon and quoted a couple passages out of the Bible uh, that seemed to allude to it, and I had no idea. I was kind of inclined to go, eh, I want nothing to do with that because they're Sunday worshipers, and Seventh Day Adventist Saturday is the big thing, you know. So I, I didn't know, but I just simply went and held the book in my hand, and I just simply asked God, God, is this true? And just simple little faith, you know. It, it, I had no preconceived notions or ideas of it, and what happened next changed my life in a dramatic way. I uh, asked him, and he told me in a, in a direct, outright revelation. And it wasn't through the ears, it was straight to the soul. And it was verbal and direct that the Book of Mormon is true. The Book of Mormon is true. And other aspects of that are hard to describe in English. Uh, I felt time compress, like the past and the future and the present were rolled into one. And pardon me, <laughs> love that I'd never know. That was so powerful and beyond imagination. Then I knew. I knew the Book of Mormon was true. So oh, I'm going to go join the Mormons again. You know, and, and uh, I had no knowledge of other factions or groups. And uh, my mother had sent the missionaries over, and I surprised their day because they came in. And I said, you guys are too late. And they go, well, what do you mean? says, I'm already converted. I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The next day I went and bought a sack full of Book of Mormons out of the DI store and I uh, went to pass around all my friends, the people I used to party with. Of course, they didn't accept it. I even shared it with, with all my relatives that I could find. I shared it with an uncle. And, uh, you know, he wasn't really convinced, but he asked me, well, what's it about? And I go, uh, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> So he just, needs to say, it wasn't successful outreach, but it, it kind of, you know, I think about it, it's like, oh, man, I must have really been on fire back then, you know. So that Sunday I went uh, to the nearby LDS church and reunited myself with them, full of zeal. Just, I'm going to be a lifelong member, I'm going to go through, do everything you want. Wrote out a check for tithing because I hadn't paid tithing ever, you know, and and the bishop and uh, and the elder with him both commented they could see the Holy Spirit in my countenance. I had no doubt about it because I could feel it, you know. And uh, later on in that that service, uh, we had a class, and uh, they started going over some of their doctrines, you know, and some of it I just couldn't quite grasp, but when they covered the doctrine of celestial marriage, the Lord gave me another outright revelation. This doctrine is not of me. It is offense to me. And I command you to ask them if they can find this in the Book of Mormon or Bible only. And I was shocked, but I did obey and ask them. And they go, yeah, 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 we can find it, you know, and they couldn't find it. You know, and so I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, I was thinking about going back to Seventh Day Adventist Church, even though I knew the Book of Mormon was true. I just didn't know what to do. And eventually, I, I was placed in contact with the Temple Lot group, and 
also heard about the RLDS, so I started investigating them both. And, I, you know, I eventually I cast my lot with uh, the Temple Lot group, for better or worse. You know, it's, it's like a marriage, you know, there's, there's flaws and there's, uh, there's good points, you know. And uh, I, I got a chuckle, uh, we talk about custodian and that revelation, man, that fit. <laughs> that really did fit. Uh, I was reading some Facebook postings. Uh, talking about this Brazil thing that I don't have much opinion on, but they, one poster compared our church to pepper on oatmeal. And then he backed off and said, well, that's a little harsh, just black coffee in the morning. I'm going, yeah, that fits. <laughs> but uh, So what did the Lord, uh, is, I'm going to get in my lesson here, uh, what did he reveal to me? You know, he told me it's true, but if I haven't read it yet, what good does it do? You know, what's, what's the point? Since then, I've read it cover to cover four times, studied it countless thousands of times, you know, and I still learn things from it. Uh, and so we want to go into this lesson here, uh, and it kind of matches most of Temple Lot doctrine, you know. It, it, they're really foundational with the Book of Mormon. Uh, why, why the need for the restoration? I, I have a uh, 63 Ford Falcon that I'm in the process of restoring. Uh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Basically, you jack up the mirror and replace the car. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, <laughs> it's, gonna, it's a long process, but... If I throw a 350 Chevy engine in it and make it a lowrider, it might be kind of cool, but it's not a restoration. It's a whatever. Restoring is you bring it back to its original condition. Uh, so why the need for a restoration? And, and I'm going to use uh, the 1908 uh, verse Book of Mormon. I don't know what everyone uses, but if your verses don't match that, that's why. And in 1 Nephi chapter 3, 179, says, neither will the Lord suffer that the Gentiles shall forever remain in that state of awful woundedness, which they, thou beholdest that they are in because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by that abominable church whose formation thou hast seen. So we know that the Gentiles, you know, our pilgrim fathers, struggled with Christianity and understanding having the Bible alone. I mean, the gospel is in the Bible. It's good, but it's you have to do a lot of digging, and you really need the Holy Spirit to help you understand it. And some have, you know, some have a fairly well uh, good understanding of the Bible, and it matches the Book of Mormon. Uh, but they're wounded, you know. It's uh, and so. One of the, the need for the restoration is this woundedness that happened in the Dark Ages that, that left us with an uh, incomplete gospel, uh, a gospel that's kind of hard to decipher. Uh, and, and people struggle, and, and the proof in the pudding is we have tens of thousands of different Christian churches, each with varying doctrines and beliefs, and, and then it kind of invaded the restoration too. In First Nephi 3, 185, and after that, thy seed shall be destroyed and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brethren. Behold, these things shall be hid up to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock and my salvation. And this is just quoted here. Uh, and blessed are they which shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day. For they shall have the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, and if they endure to the end, they shall be lifted up the last day and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. Yea, whosoever shall publish peace and shall publish tidings of great joy, how beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. So publishing this and sharing it and witnessing it and, and actually understanding it and teaching what's in there is the fulfillment of this this prophecy in Isaiah about how beautiful upon the mountains are, shall they be. And uh, it's this. It, it's not about a, a particular church or leader or, or program or whatever. It's that. It's the Book of Mormon. It's plain as day. Uh, 
what does restoration mean? You know, and I just covered about my car, you know, I, uh, if I made it into a actual 63 Ford Falcon, it would be that, you know, and restored and, and even when they were brand new, they're not that great of cars, but, <laughs> you know, it, if you restore it, 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 that's what it is. Uh, and uh, Mormon 4101, and these things are written that we may rid our garments of the blood of our brethren which have dwindled in unbelief. And behold, these things which we have desired concerning our brethren, yea, even their restoration to the knowledge of Christ is according to the prayers of all the saints which had dwelt in the land. So part of the restoration is taking this gospel to the ancient covenant people, uh, the, the Native Americans, the Jews, uh, the tribes we may not know who they are, or really anyone who would be willing to be adopted in, is, uh, is the, that's, that's what restoration means. And uh, other parts of restoration means the Jews being restored to Israel, and that ha has happened. And that has been fulfilled. You know, you, you, in the Book of Mormon is written well before this event occurred, so it's another prophecy that has been fulfilled. Uh, here's one of the hallmarks of my beliefs, uh, Mormon 468. For do not, for do we not read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing. Now, if you have imagined up unto yourselves a God which the very in him there is a shadow of changing, then you have imagined up unto yourselves a God which is not a God of miracles. And uh, that is one of the things that's kind of led to the division and uh, uh, differences in the restoration is uh, the uh, changing God, uh, changing doctrines. Uh, it, it's there, you know, and God does not change, not even a hint of changing. He's eternal. He's perfect from the beginning perfect in the end and there is no end really it's timeless you know and I experienced that timelessness it, you know it's uh, when I had my witness I experienced that timelessness that unchangingness and he is a God of miracles and you know I've experienced miracles I don't that my witness the Book of Mormon was a miracle the man that baptized me raised at least two people from the dead and has healed a lot of people the man that baptized me has also made mistakes, you know, and it brought him hurt and others hurt. And that's the same way with Joseph Smith. He's done many mighty great things, but he's made mistakes too that led to his hurt and others. So how great a calling it is for those in authority and positions of power to be faithful and diligent because the consequences when they're not can be very devastating to everyone. In 3 Nephi 1234, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel, and you know the things that ye should, must do in my church. For the works that ye have seen me do, that shall ye also do. For that which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. Therefore, if ye do these things, blessed are ye, for ye shall be lifted up at the last day. And that's another hallmark teaching that, that I really grasp onto. Did Jesus ever get married to one or many wives? Or did he ever teach celestial marriage or other things? He did not. He even taught against that stuff. So this is how we know with a plainness and simplicity that the things that you've seen me do, that do in my church. In 2 Nephi 2.19, Wherefore, the fruit of my loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, and that which shall be written by the fruit of my loins, and also the fruit, or that, okay, let me, and fruit of mine, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins, and bringing them 
to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter day, and also to the knowledge of my covenant, saith the Lord. So these two works, they're, you know, some people think when we, we uh, espouse the Book of Mormon that we're somehow diminishing the Bible, and that's not what the Book of Mormon teaches. It says the two, the two shall grow into one. And that was the intent of the Book of Mormon. This is to be the second witness to, to, to establish what we already have, not to destroy it or diminish it in any way. It's meant to back it up, to, to show people that there's more than one witness of Christ. There's two, two very powerful and strong witnesses. But also we talked about, you know, in, in this uh, symposium here about the contentions and the divisions in the uh, restoration, uh, the cure, the solution, the, the antidote for this is what we just read. These words were written to confound false doctrines, to lay down contentions, to establish peace among the fruit of thy loins. So that's what its purpose is, to, to, to unite, to heal, to cure, and if we fail to read it and study it in depth, then it's on us. Or if we think we're following this, but really we're following some guy or some other person, you know, uh, it's on us. You know, we, we have our guide here. We, we have the, the direction that God has given us. And it, it's incumbent upon us to be diligent in studying it. You know, study, there's a proverb that says, much study is weariness. And he's right. <laughs> you know, it is tedious at times to study, but it's, it's necessary, especially in this day of age of, of deception and, and wandering. Uh, it, much study is needed. <coughs> Excuse me. First Nephi 4.16. Now the thing which our father means concerning the grafting in of the natural branches, we're talking about that today, through the fullness of the Gentiles, is that in the latter days when our seed shall dwindle in unbelief, yea, for the space of many years and many generations, and after that the Messiah hath manifested himself in body unto the children of men, then shall the fullness of the gospel, you know, fullness means completeness, of the Messiah come unto the Gentiles. And that was fulfilled in 1829. And from the Gentiles unto the remnant of our seed. And that is in the process of being fulfilled. And at that day shall the remnant of our seed know that they are of the house of Israel. And that they are the covenant people of the Lord. And then shall they know and come to the knowledge of their forefathers. You know, this is the history of their, their forefathers. And also to the knowledge of the gospel of their Redeemer, which was ministered unto their fathers by him. Wherefore, they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer and the very points of his doctrine, that they may know how to come unto him and be saved. So this is another meaning and purpose of the Book of Mormon, is to understand the very points of his doctrine. Often people get caught up in other doctrines <coughs> that aren't in the Book of Mormon. But we do know of the Book of Mormon that it contains the fullness of the gospel, the whole enchilada. Uh, do I believe in Latter-day Revelation? Absolutely. I've experienced it. But it, as Isaiah states, if it's not according to the law and the testimony, it's because there is no light in them. So there's the standard there, a, a foundation that we can hold on to and grasp. And as we do, as, as, as mentioned, I believe a unity of the different factions and, and faiths are possible. So what is this Christ that we have been restored to? In Mosiah 1, 111, it says, And many signs and wonders and types and shadows showed he unto them concerning his coming. So the whole law of Moses, going back in the Old Testament, uh, some of it's hard to understand and wade through, uh, but there's many types and shadows uh, of Christ. Um, one was uh, 
when Moses lifted up the brass serpent, and all the people had to do is look to it. And when they were bitten by the poison serpents, they were healed. Ironically, with that, this, this blew me away. I just learned this recently. Uh, with that brass serpent, uh, the people made an idol out of it, and it had to be destroyed. It is strange how even good things people can make idols out of. They can make people idols out of a building or a person or their church, you know, or whatever, their authority, you name it. There's only one that should be worshipped, and we, of course, know who that is. In John 6.35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Back in the law of Moses' time, they had the manna from heaven. And Jesus fulfilled that as another type and shadow. That, that It's all pointing to Christ. That, so the whole purpose of the law of Moses and all those things that those people went through, even in their boneheadedness, it was to point them to Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus makes some pretty bold claims, but... When you dig into it, it's real. It's, tr it's the truth. John eleven twenty five, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's one thing that, you know, when I first got into religion out of my apostate life was a hope for eternity. It was beautiful. I thought, you die, you're going to get it by worms, and that's it, <laughs> you know. And, and here we have something that we can hang our hat on, you know, and, and have a hope. that Not just in this life we have hope, but in the, in the future. In 3 Nephi 7.10, it says, Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me, and endure to the end, and you shall live. For unto him that endureth to the end will I give eternal life. Enduring is hard. I know a lot of people here have been through a lot of hardships. Um, maligned in wherever group they came out of, uh, excommunicated. Me, when I realized uh, how far out of the way the group I was originally with, I volunteered for it. I even went to the elders' court, looked them right in the eye, and told them, for righteousness reason, I am leaving you. They didn't know how to handle that. You know, but lift up your heads. You know, if you've been felt like it, you were mistreated, it's for a good thing. It, it, you know, it's much like uh, the Zoramites, the poor, who helped build their, their place of worship, and, and they were run out because of their poverty. It ended up being a blessing to them because they were able to learn wisdom and, and learn that it's not in that building they were kicked out of that was important, but that they had faith and, and redemption in Christ. Uh, next passage I have is in Hebrews 9.11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So this is a Hebrew, the whole book of Hebrews is about the fulfillment of the law of Moses that Christ did, how all these things under the law of Moses, the high priest, the, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the manna, uh, the candlestick, even the light, uh, were all fulfilled on the cross and uh, what, what the, that all meant. John 2.19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus was also a fulfillment of the temple because what did they do in that temple? They sacrificed animals, they offered the different offerings and sacrifices in very regimented set ways by the high priest. And Jesus was showing them that they didn't understand <coughs> that he was the fulfillment of that part also. 
Now, some of you might ask Brother Mike, what about the New Jerusalem? Is that going to have a temple? Uh, how do you think about that? Uh, I go, well, yeah, absolutely, I hope to have part, either in this life or next, in the building of the New Jerusalem on this land somewhere. Will it have a temple? Absolutely. I'm not certain whether it be a building or if it won't be Christ himself. Uh, that's just my take. Some of my brethren might disagree with me, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's just my take on that. Uh, but I do definitely believe that we will assist uh, the ancient covenant people in building that new Jerusalem when that time comes. Book of Hebrews. Uh, before I mention that, that there has been in the restoration uh, something called the new and everlasting covenant. That's something else. And Lord revealed to me what that was not of him. This is the new covenant the new and everlasting covenant. In Hebrews 12, 24, into Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So Abel was about the animal sacrifices. Uh, the new covenant is Jesus and what he did on the cross and his blood. Hebrews 13, 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So we've got the new covenant and the everlasting covenant right there. And again, it's talking about the covenant he makes with you when you accept him and, and you rely on his blood for your, your salvation, your forgiveness, your washing. Hebrews 8, 6, and now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Again, back to the mission of Christ, how he fulfilled it all. And, and finally, in this part, Luke 23, 45, and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. <laughs> So right at that minute, that instant that Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled all in the veil in the temple that shrouded the Holy of Holies was rent in twain. It was now done, finished. So what is this new and everlasting covenant? In Jeremiah 31, 33, but this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. This is one of our issues that came up. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So it wasn't any man that convinced me of the Book of Mormon. I knew it by the Holy Ghost. Uh, he, he put his law in my inward parts. It couldn't be better described that experience I went through. Uh, and no man said, believe this, believe this. I, I found it on my own it, through the Holy Spirit. It's at the right time, the right moment, the Lord knew it and, and he fulfilled his promises. You know, it, it's fulfilled. In Acts 2, 38, and then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the fulfillment of that covenant. That's the covenant you make with God. That's how you say, I do, to God. You know, a lot of people have different ways uh, of accepting Christ, but God's way of accepting, accepting Christ, how you say, I do, to him is through baptism and repentance of your own choice. You know, when I was eight, I was baptized, and I thought I was supposed to glow in the dark. You know, so I didn't believe in God. I was ordained at age 12, I think, uh, as a deacon. I wasn't called. I had no idea what a calling was, or I didn't even believe in God. Why the thunder would I be called if I didn't believe in God? So, you know, uh, yeah, it's amazing. 
but that's traditionality for you. You know, that's that's you know, you get stuck in a tradition and you go through the motions, not really understanding why are we doing this. Later on, when I was age 23, I was able to to ask for a baptism, and maybe I wasn't perfectly ready for it, but I did it anyway, and and all that guilt and filth and sin in my life was gone. It wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't uh, uh, just a dogma or whatever. It, it was a reality. You know, I was able to walk away from my past and start a new life, and I'm still starting a new life. You know, and I uh, I'm happy to be here. I thank uh, Adrian, and Tasha, and, and Tony for pointing me into this direction. You know, and I'm glad to meet you people. Uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> 15 minutes? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I might end it. It's either I can answer questions or tell a bad uh, burrow joke. <laughs> yeah, back up the mountains over there, some hunters came from back east, went hunting for elk, and this farmer left a, let a mule go uh, because he just didn't want to take care of it, so he let him run wild. And the uh, ranger in that area knew about that, and he didn't care, you know, so. But these uh, hunters from back east came and shot the poor thing and tagged it as an elk. <laughs> and, and that, you know, and they're happy that they got an elk. And they went up to the check station. The ranger was there, and he, he immediately re realized, that, okay, I know who this is. And it's like, yeah, you're good. <laughs> so... <laughs> Any questions? Comments? <laughs> <laughs> All right, lunch time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. And now it is time for lunch. So um, we will meet back here at 1.45. Is that what I have? We'll start. So why don't we meet here at um, 1.30? So that gives you about an hour and a half. Um, I've been sending out multiple emails about this, but go find some lunch somewhere. You're welcome to eat in this room. Um, there's lots of places nearby. We're really close to downtown. And um, hopefully you can kind of get to know each other a little bit, say hello, get to know someone new. And it's just been a wonderful morning. So glad we're here. Can't wait for the second half. Thanks. <laughs>